Okay, finishing up here on our series of lectures on Rome. This one uh, showing you some architecture uh, and art, some things from Rome. Uh, as we noted previously, the Romans were great admirers of the Greeks, and we can see that in their architecture. And, and this is examples from the Roman Forum, uh, the big main public meeting area uh, with all the buildings for the Senate and everything else. Uh, you can see the Greek style columns. Uh, that are modeled on the Greeks. I've got um, here another view of the same thing. Uh, the open area, the uh, Greek style columns, Corinthian style, and even a reconstruction of what they thought it may have looked like, an opening uh, set of gates to pass through in the big, large open area, uh, senatorial buildings, other uh, buildings for uh, not just the Senate, but also the uh, tribunes, the representatives of the uh, plebeians. So lots of things. This is the idea we talked about in the Empire of Rome where Augustus found Rome a city of bricks and left it a city of marble. This is one of the massive building projects undertaken by several emperors throughout their, uh, the history of the Roman Empire. This is Hadrian's Wall. We talked about Hadrian. I drew on the map for you uh, in the first and the beginning of the second videos. Uh, his wall across uh, England, dividing between England and Scotland. The wall is still there. You can still go to this day and see it. In fact, it's only about 90 miles. You can actually go walk parts of it in some parts. Almost missing, but for the most part, you can trace the entire thing still there. They literally had uh, forts about every mile and a little outpost where they could far enough where they can kind of see and keep track of each other uh, and look for um, you know any at attempts to cross the wall. Uh, realize also that these guys on the frontier probably mingled with, maybe even married with, and traded with people on the frontier so things are um, not as completely adversarial all the time. And I remember, you maybe remember also I told you the fact that we could get a letter from way out here on the frontier back to Rome in about a week. Okay, while they were great admirers of Greek architecture and their style of columns and that uh, two to one golden mean ratio that the Greeks used, they also add something to architecture and this is arches and domes. Okay, an arch is a curving structure which can help support weight by taking the weight up here at the top and dispersing it down the legs to the bottom this way. The top of the arch, this is called the keystone. Um, add several arches together, you can get what then is called a barrel vault, and from there also you take two vaults and run them into each other, and where they come together they form a cross vault. And if you take a arch like this and sort of spun it on its axis, so at a point coming right through the keystone here, you would end up with a dome. Romans become uh, some great builders of Rome and some of the uh, oldest examples of domes date back to the ancient Romans. Here is our Colosseum, and I'll show you various uh, examples of the Colosseum, uh, size-wise and picture-wise, and we some information on that a little bit. You can see uh, several stories tall here. I believe it was one, two, three, four stories tall completely, um, and at the center actually sort of is below ground level, and this is actually areas that were below what would be the stage area of. Uh, the Colosseum. You can see a little bit of that right down in here. Again, this use of columns but arches as well to build the entire building. Let me expand this one to kind of show you a little bit. You can see the continuous sets of arches. This is what this interior style would be. This is sort of the interior, then this would be sort of like aisleways and aisleways, and this is the facade on the outside with the Greek style. This style with the more brick is what we later refer to as Romanesque style architecture as the Middle Ages began and we start building uh, things again. This is a Romanesque style. When they start getting into a new style later on, much higher and a different type of arch that will be referred to as a Gothic style. Okay, our Colosseum, just so you know here, let me expand that just a little bit for view time. This is built from AD 720 to 80. 
Um, it's just an oval. It's not a circle. It combines two Greek-style amphitheaters, which weren't complete semicircles, and so our result, end result is here a sort of oval-shaped, uh, built by the Emperor Flavian. We would see gladiators fighting in there, which we all know probably most uh, common uh, thing for people to remember from that time period. Uh, also a contest with wild animals, wild animals against gladiators, but not so much because we don't want to kill the animals again. They're expensive. Uh, sometimes threw Christians in there as well, but again, uh, same kind of thing. We don't want to spend too much money on that. Aqueducts. We've talked about aqueducts. Uh, some of the aqueducts the Romans built still exist thousands of years later. This aqueduct happens to be in France, 31 miles long. This one brought in eight to 12,000 gallons of water a day, and large cities would have several of these bringing water to them. So you saw those canats we saw in uh, Persia that we saw with Ian showing us um, that they dug underground. Well, sometimes when they were, had to cross an area uh, in the Roman Empire, they would go underground if possible because that helped keep the water cool, but if they had to transverse sort of a valley area, they would bring that and build this bridge. They built bridges, they built aqueducts, some of these things are still around. Got a friend of mine who's from Segovia, Spain. That's the biggest tourist attraction. Okay, other uses of arches were for commemorative or decorative purposes. Uh, this is the Arch of Titus built in AD 81, 47 feet tall, not quite three stories. This celebrates his many victories, uh, and it was originally a building built onto it, and this is what we have, this sort of remains. This is Constantine's Arch, uh, the builder of Constantinople. Uh, he does, goes not for just one, but for three, uh, commemorating all of his victories. And I forget which panel, one of these panels is uh, commemorated to decorate that idea where he paints the crosses on the men's shield and they win the victory. Uh, other type of Greek, uh, Roman, excuse me, Roman art uh, is mosaics. This is a, a mosaic here. Mosaics are made of art from little tiny tiles, individual pieces of tile, uh, put together to form pictures, uh, often on floors, sometimes smaller ones on the walls as well. We get into painting on walls, which is a fresco. Uh, this technique is something that actually predates the ancient Greeks, so well before the Romans. Uh, this example here is a calendar uh, depicting the 12 months, so one, two, three, and then we have four going down this way, so we have 12. Uh, this one is actually four feet by five feet to give you a sense of the scale of that. This is one of street musicians. This is uh, one that would probably be in, on the wall, much more detailed, but also much smaller, 17 by 16 inches. Look at the amount of detail for using individual little pieces of glass and stone. This is one uh, called Preparations for a Banquet. Uh, I, I like these because I'm, I'm sort of a food person. Uh, this one, people getting ready, they're bringing in the food, uh, bringing in the hot drinks and other uh, things for the wealthy people who are having their banquet. This one over seven feet by six feet, almost seven feet square. And then after the banquet, they have uh, one of my favorites. This is the remains of the meal uh, after the feast. And you can pause here if you want to and go th see through here and see how many things you can identify as you know animal parts that were left over that sort of end up on the floor, as it were. Uh, from the feast, only in this case these aren't scraps to be cleaned up, these are actually decorations in the floor itself. We're even showing shadow areas, that's amazing. Okay, our common apartments, this is a very Romanesque style of building, uh, very blocky, almost sort of overbuilt at times, especially with the bricks, very thick, very little air getting through here. The problem with this is they absorb a lot of heat and they get very hot and there's not a lot of ventilation. So that's the idea of people being outside them because it's so hot on the inside. Uh, this is one that obviously wasn't one of the ones that fell down. And these were brick versions were ones to replace a lot of the wooden ones which did burn down. This is one of the most famous uh, examples of Roman arch architecture. This is the Pantheon ex exterior. Again, we see very much that Greek style influence here with the two to one ratio, but also in our Greek style columns, but also a nod to Egypt, which was part of the Roman Empire here with an obelisk. Uh, looking at it from the front here, we can clearly see uh, the very Greek style and we, we sort of missed then the rounded 
parts behind, which are indicative of that dome and sort of rounded arch type things that we've talked about that the Romans bring to architecture. This is the interior view of the uh, Pantheon. It's got one opening here. This uh, um, opening is about 42 feet wide, I believe. Uh, that's the only actual light source on the inside. This is actually a poured concrete dome. I'll show you uh, a little bit more detail about that in a, in a moment. You can kind of see some of that detail in here. And I can't tell if it's on this one or the other one. Uh, actually, you can get a small sense of scale. These are about human sized statues here. But if you look at this, image right here. I'm just going to expand it just a little bit for you. Over here, this is a person. So if this is against the wall, you can sort of get a sense of the scale. And let's look at what those exact dimensions are. Uh, this is built in AD 126. It's 72 feet in radius or 142 feet in diameter across the opening of, not the opening up here, but the, across the base of the dome itself. This is Greek style. We saw that on the outside meets Roman engineering with the concrete and the poured dome. Uh, this is the oldest standing domed structure in the world. Okay. Now, again, I told you that the Greeks and the Romans and even Alexander, as they expanded places, they took over. They didn't just take you over. They sort of co-opted you into their culture, made life better. This is uh, Tim God in Algeria, which is in northern Africa, around AD 100. And you can see the Roman building projects that have been done here. We've got that, again, uh, Greek-style amphitheater over here, uh, whether this was just a Theater one, I can't tell from if it came around or not, was a, a gladiatorial competition, or a gladiatorial kind of coliseum, or rather just a, a, a amphitheater. I don't know. Look at all of the remains here that would have been just a massive city built in, literally in the desert of North Africa to give you an idea of the spread of Romans as they spread around, not just taking over, but also helping other folks advance. This is uh, Trajan's victory column. Uh, uh, this is sort of the idea of an obelisk from uh, Egypt influence, but instead of being in that you know four-sided obelisk shape, this is a, a column sort of playing on the idea of celebrating my victories instead of an arch. Uh, what he's doing here, this is 125 feet tall. It's in Rome. Uh, celebrates uh, Trajan's victories in Dancia, which is today Romania, and it's a spiral relief. If you can see here, it's running up the sides here with the details carved into it. Let's take a look at those, showing the details of his victories and his battle and the things. Uh, we're not going to see things like this uh, after the fall of Rome and uh, as Europe uh, becomes very, very backwards, especially compared to the Byzantine Empire, uh, until the Bayou Tapestry, uh, dealing with the Norman conquests in England. But that, however, is a stitched version versus this Sculpture, again, they said that the Romans uh, adopted that um, late Greek, more lifelike versus that idealized style that was uh, most commonly associated with the Greeks. Uh, so I thought I'd bring Brutus and Caesar together because you know, they do so well together. Uh, you can see here, Brutus, this is not an, an idealized, beautiful, handsome guy. Uh, Try to be very lifelike and detailed. Uh, you can see here, this is actually carved. You can see the hairline, you can see the beard, you can see uh, wrinkles a as well and the eyes. Uh, this one of Julius Caesar, some people, um, you can see the hair is a little bit stylized. We do see a receding hairline here. We do see some wrinkles. Um, a lot of people kind of, what's with his eyes here? Uh, a lot of these statues in ancient times would have been painted to make them very lifelike, and so our eyes would have been painted in. Uh, this is sort of, the, again, that realistic style that happens later versus what happens later with sort of a, uh, a, a nod back to the Greco style, um, that earlier Greek style that was sort of um, more... Um, what I want to say more idealized than realistic. So we get the realistic over here. Look at the folds in the toga, how realistic this is. Uh, versus over here, it's a little more simplified. Uh, we, we, it, this was actually part of a colossal statue that would should be uh, several stories tall. About all that's left of this one is uh, the head uh, and the hands. 
hey, it's the end. What can we say? I uh, hope you enjoyed this look at some of the achievements of, of the Romans, but uh, visual things that are left, you still can't uh, include all the things uh, in terms of law and codes and organization of things that still influence us to this very day. So it's important to note that some of the things that led to the fall of ancient Rome are things we need to watch for in societies in the world today. Hey, they were around for almost 2,000 years. How long have we been around? Give it a thought. Talk to you later.